Hey, well, good morning and uh, welcome to our new series. We're kicking off a day, Family Fails. Good morning, all the folks joining us uh, live streaming, live Facebook, uh, out in the Refuge Service. Uh, we're so glad that you're with us. If you've got a Bible with you today, or maybe you've got your phone or you've got a handout, uh, once you take it, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, and today we're going to pick up. Uh, if you've been in church very long, it's a familiar passage of Scripture, Ephesians 5, uh, beginning there in verse 21 and kind of working uh, down through the passage. This is a passage that deals with uh, the husband and wife relationship in marriage and the roles and that kind of stuff like that. So we're going to work through that uh, this morning. Uh, probably if you're like me. Now this message today too, again, we're talking about the family in the next couple of weeks. So this pertains to everyone, uh, younger, older, married, not married, thinking about getting married, and no kids, have kids, thinking about having kids, all this kind of stuff. So it applies to all of us today. But probably for those, if you're like me, Angie and I have been married uh, for about 30 years now. And uh, I can tell you probably more as a husband what not to do than what to do. And uh, if you're you're like me probably also, you probably look back over the course of time and there's probably some uh, memorable events that you never want to recreate history again, okay? Uh, we've all made mistakes, all failed. One of those that happened that's uh, very memorable to me, etched in my mind, probably for almost all eternity, I guess you'll say, but it occurred the day after Angie and I got back from our honeymoon. Now, many of you know this, Angie and I were married at First Baptist Church in Forest City, uh, she's in Forest City, Arkansas. Uh, Max, Brother Max Gorman, was our pastor uh, who married us. We had one, uh, we had one, if we call it a premarital counseling session, and I've shared this before, where he asked me if I loved her, and I said yes. He said, no, you're infatuated with her, and I, I was thinking, I don't even know what that means, but you know what, he said, you're going to grow to love her, and he was correct uh, in what he was saying. And uh, so anyway, we uh, asked her to marry me in February. We get married in June. Now, I've got kind of an ag background. And so I was working at that time. I'd come off the farm right out of college, moved to Forest City, had set my sights on Miss Angie and uh, was uh, asking her to marry me, you know, and all this stuff and uh, had a place of employment and had a house that I was renting for $125 a month. It was a beautiful marriage cottage in the backside of about a 60-acre cow pasture where you had to go through a cattle guard. If many of y'all, if you know what that is, you had to drive through a cattle guard. The house was surrounded by four-strand barbed wire fence. You parked in the cow pasture. There was no garage or covering for your vehicle. Parked in the cow pasture and went through a small gate made out of barbed wire to get to the marriage cottage back there. And if you wasn't careful, it would grab your shirt when you went by and that kind of stuff. So one bedroom, wood stove, Kitchen and a screened-in back porch sitting on the bank of a pond. It was blissful. I just want you to know. So anyway, I had that place, and so Angie and I get married. We leave, I think, on a Saturday. My employer at that time, uh, the far uh, farmer's co-op in Forest City, Ronnie Carey, was there. He told me, he said, Archie, he said, where are you going to take Angie on your honeymoon? I said, I have no idea. He said, well, you need to take her somewhere nice. I said, I don't have any money. Here's what he said. He said, I'm going to give you $500. I said, Woo, okay. And so I go back home. My grandpa, my grandpa says, where are you going to take Angie on your honeymoon? I said, I don't know. I don't have a lot of money. He said, I'm going to give you $500. I thought, I need to start making the rounds. I'm going to build some resources. So anyway, uh, Angie and I were able to go on a honeymoon. It's the first time I'd ever flown in an airplane. And so, I mean, went to a place that's all inclusive. That means you get to eat everything. You know, it's all paid for. And so it was just great. But it's in the summer. And so we get back in like on a Sunday from our honeymoon. We were able to spend a week away. And so I had to hit the, hit the fields on Monday, hard and heavy, okay, back working at the co-op and all this stuff. And so unbeknownst to me, Angie stayed home. Now, I'm about to tell you something. Etched in my mind for all eternity. What not to do as a husband, okay? It's one of these, if we call it a marriage fail, it was my bad, my fail, I messed up. Unbeknownst to me, Angie was home cooking our first married meal together in the kitchen. I think it took her half a day to prepare it. And she can cook. And I can remember coming in, I was tired. I was sweaty, stinky, all this stuff. I go in. So I pull through the cattle uh, gap, drive in the pasture park, go through the barbed wire fence, come in the back door that sits on the bank of the pond, walk in by the wood stove, and there's a kitchen table. Angie has this big spread out there. She is so proud. She's done so well. And sitting in the middle of the table, there's stuff everywhere. It's like a feast. Sitting in the middle of the table is a bowl this big of potato salad. There had to be like a whole sack full of potatoes in that bowl. Potato salad. And so I walk in, I look at that. These are the words that came out of my mouth I wish I could take back. Here's what I said. I don't like potato salad. <laughs> Let me just tell you, the four city came out in that little woman. <laughs> you know, I mean, we had our... First, and it wasn't a, uh, just an all-out fight, but it was one of those things. I learned as a man that I would never do that again. 
And if she ever fixes something for me that I don't like, I'm going to smile and eat all of it and tell her how much I love her and how good it is at the same time. Okay, now, sometimes we say, well, the secret to a, a great marriage then is to eat whatever she puts in front of you. Okay, you say that. Or the secret to a great marriage is to pick your clothes up out of the floor, men. Oh, come on, man. Thank you. He's a real man. Pick your clothes up out of the floor, put them in the hamper. I mean, there's some practical things that we may do as a married couple, get on each other's nerves that we don't have to do. We can work on. But the secret to a great marriage is not picking up your clothes, putting them in a clothes hamper, but you need to do that, men, okay? Uh, the secret to a great marriage is not necessarily opening the, the door for your wife, but you need to do that, men. The secret to a great marriage is the gospel. It's a death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You say, oh, preacher, you're coming back. Jesus is the answer for everything. Yes. The secret to a great marriage is the gospel. And I'm going to read a passage to you that for some, there are some who, you know, would want to disagree with God's word and don't like this passage. But I believe it's because maybe there's a misunderstanding and mixed conception of this passage. So I hope today uh, that it will bring great clarity to help us understand the roles of a husband and wife in marriage and how marriage is preparation for heaven. Because through marriage, we are becoming conformed to the image of Christ. We are practicing Christ's likeness in marriage, which is preparation for heaven. You'll see as we get through the passage. Would you stand with me for the public reading? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Now, this is Paul, writing church at Ephesus, okay? Speaking particularly here, and then next week, we'll continue on in Ephesians 6. That's a plan about parenting. But this is about marriage. He says, be subject to one another in fear of Christ. Mutual submission in marriage. Right there in the first verse. 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So that, it's purpose clause. So that, here's a reason. He might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That he might... Present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Now, this is sacrificial love, okay? Putting her needs above your needs, putting her above yourself. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it, okay? It's the idea of growing it, okay? Cherishing it, looking after that, just as Christ also does the church. Because we're members of his body, verse 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's leaving and cleaving. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Marriage is a picture of the church and its relationship with Christ. Nevertheless, each individual among you is also to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word on marriage. We need this. Those of us in this room, younger, older, married, single, with kids, no kids, families, grandmas, grandpas, Lord, we all need this word. For some who've been in a church a long time, maybe it's a reminder, renewing. For others, it's a brand new. You've never heard this before. But, Lord, this is the secret of a great marriage right here. We see the gospel, the death, burial, resurrection of you, Lord Jesus, and how we're becoming conformed to you, Christ. So, Lord, speak to us today. Uh, there are some, uh, probably some families need to be renewed and strengthened and encouraged, maybe relationships made stronger. But, Lord, I also know there's some folks who need to be saved, who need to be born again, just like me at the age of 25. Lord, you saved me. So I pray you do that here today uh, out in the refuge service. Lord, I pray that you work and move in a great way. Your name we pray, name of Jesus, and all God's people said, Amen, amen. Please be seated if you would. Again, thanks for standing for the uh, public reading of Scripture as we come together uh, this morning. The gospel empowers wives to, uh, we use the word surrender and submit, okay? Submission is a, when you see this in the Bible, the New Testament, it's a military term, which means that if you're in the military, I know we got many of our vet, veterans in here, men and women who served. My dad served in the Navy. So it's the idea that when you're uh, part of a, uh, the armed services, you don't have your own personal agenda. Uh, your agenda submits and comes under the leadership of the U.S. government or the general or whatever the command is. So you, you voluntarily lay down your rights and you submit to the agenda or the leadership of the U.S. government or the commander of the armed service. So this is the idea. It's a military term that's found here. So in verse 21, it is mutual submission. So, and, when it, and he says it once to husbands, but he says it twice, okay, 
to wives. And in a moment when he talks about that we are to love our wives the way that Christ loved the church as men, that's the idea of submitting, okay, putting her needs above our needs and, and her wants above our wants and, you know, uh, raising her up while basically us loving her in such a way. And, and the Bible tells us that if we'll do that as women and as men, we will have a, a great marriage, a great relationship with one another. So it's the idea first we see of mutual submission. Then he picks up there uh, in the next verse of uh, verse uh, 22, and he says, wives, be subject to uh, your own husbands. Now, this is where I believe that sometimes what we have is we, we have this idea, we misinterpret this text. We, we have a misconception about it. Now, when I was growing up as a kid, I had a great family uh, there in Bisco, mom and dad. Uh, my dad got saved uh, uh, in his 20s, and uh, him and mom were growing a church, and so a great Christian home, this kind of stuff. And, and my dad, I never saw my mom and dad fight, ever. I never remember them fighting or anything like that or having harsh words with one another. I'm sure there were some healthy disagreements at the time, but I, was, I did not see that. But here's one thing. My dad would lovingly and almost jokingly Many times we'd be in a conversation. So kids, as kids, we're always listening, okay? Uh, he lovingly and jokingly, he would always, I say always, many times would say, the Bible says that the wife is to submit to her husband, okay? And he would say that. My mom would just kind of look at him, you know, when he'd say that. And, uh, but I never heard 21 where it said mutual submission in a relationship. I'd never heard that, okay? And so I would hear that. Now, I kind of grew up thinking, well, what, you know, what does that mean as a kid? And, and so what happens in a lot of uh, cultures and places, it begins to mean things that's not intended. Sometimes people look at that and they say, well, the, the wife is to bow down to every whim or every notion of the husband or everything that he wants to do that she does not have a voice in it and she can't make a decision. Sometimes people even take that text and say, well, that uh, the wife is lesser. Okay, now, ladies, please understand, that's not what it means. But sometimes people will take it and say the, the wife is devalued and she's lesser than the husband. That's not what this text is teaching. Ladies, please understand, uh, this text is not teaching that the wife is to be a doormat, that the husband just wipes his feet on anytime he wants to. I mean, that is not in the context of this, okay? So he says, wives be subject to your husbands. Now, now, here's what we need to understand about this. When a wife is following, okay, the biblical command of submission, which is a military term of uh, laying down her agenda, okay, to fall under the headship and the leadership of the husband, okay, it doesn't mean that she's devalued. It does not mean that she's not equal, okay? But here's what it demonstrates. When a wife does that, okay, it said once to the husband, twice to the wife. When the wife does that, she is demonstrating and expressing the attribute and the characteristic of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, what? Now, I want you to think about this. The Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, okay, always have been always will be coexistent, preexistent, okay? Uh, Jesus was not created by the Father. They have always existed. One, the Godhead, one God, we see this, we see three persons here. They know everything that's going on, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, Father, and everything that's going on. But here's, when the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that the Lord Jesus voluntarily, okay, uh, that he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but voluntarily, okay? And you can go on down through it. He emptied himself, taking on the appearance of the form of a man. Jesus Christ, okay, voluntarily submitted to the will of the Father to come to this earth, to be born of a virgin Mary, okay, to be a baby in the manger, grow, and he was perfect. He's the God-man, never sinned, uh, to mature, to grow, uh, to be the blood sacrifice for you and me. Jesus Christ demonstrated, okay, submission by submitting to the will of the Father. Wives, when you follow this, not a doormat, not devalued. We live in a culture where it says, well, Whatever the position is determines value. That's not biblical, okay? In the, the relationship of husband and wife, we are created equal before God. We have different roles, but the Bible does say, and we'll talk about that, that the man is to be the head of the family. He's to give leadership, okay? Sacrificially loving his wife the way Christ loved the church. So it's not that you're devalued. It's not that you're lesser. But in fact, what you do, you are 
uh, demonstrating, expressing the attribute of the Lord Jesus Christ because he willingly submitted to the will of the Father, and if we can say of the Godhead, to come to this earth, okay? That's when it says he emptied himself. That's the idea of that. Not of his deity or his divinity, but again, he came in submission to the will of the Godhead to be that human sacrifice, that blood sacrifice, so that we can have eternal life. So, think about this, wise. When you biblically obey this in the way, not like a doormat, not that you don't have an opinion, not that you have a discussion, but when you do that, you are reflecting and demonstrating, expressing the attribute and the characteristic of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, secondly, what you're doing in regard to this idea of submission and surrender is that you are reflecting the image of God. Now, when you go back into Genesis chapter 1, you get over in 26 and 27, it talks about how God created Adam in his image, and it says, and he created them, male and female, in his image. Now, ladies, not only do men reflect the image of God, but also as ladies, you reflect the image of God. Now, here's what's so cool about this. When you also back over in Genesis, and the Bible tells us in Genesis 2, okay, that we know it kind of gives a commentary on Genesis 1, but Genesis 2, it says that God created all things and it was good, okay? They're all good, 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 good. And he says he places Adam uh, in the garden to cultivate it and keep it, okay? But then also that he told Adam not to eat of this tree, but then also it's basically after at the creation of Adam, he looks around and he says it's not good, okay? So good, 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 then not good because he said it's not good for him to be alone. He says, I will create a helper suitable for him. Now, when you see that word helper, sometimes it conjures up all kinds of ideas, kind of like submit does. You think, well, that's like she has not a voice. She's devalued. No, that's not what it means, okay? When you see the word helper, it's like, okay, she just stands there just waiting on whatever his whim is so she can run and, and, and do something for him. Uh, not necessarily. Do you realize that the word that's used for helper which is uh, a demonstration of a woman in the creation of Eve. It's the same word in Psalm 33, I think it's verse 20, where the Bible says, God is my help. You, you realize that word help and helper in the Hebrew is a word that's used for God himself. So when it says, God is my help, he is my help, he is my shield, what does that mean? When we're praying, say, God, you are my help, you are my shield. What does that mean? You're my help. God, because I am insufficient and because I am lacking, God, you're the only one who can do this in my life. God, you are my help, you are my shield. Ladies, when God created Eve, why did he create her? Because Adam was insufficient and he was lacking. And God took a male and a female to represent the image of God. Now, I want you to grasp this, okay? This is why I know there's a gift of singleness. We see the Apostle Paul writing, being single. He said, I wish you were like me, that you basically were not married and you just spent your time, you know, preaching Jesus and all this. So he has this gift of singleness. Most people, okay, and I believe it's an actual giftness of love. Most people don't have it. Most folks are going to get uh, married in this. Why is that? Because... Marriage is a preparation. Now, if you're single and have a gift of singleness, it doesn't mean that uh, you're not being prepared for heaven. You are. Please don't think that, okay? We see the Apostle Paul, greatest theologian. We see uh, basically in the Bible, besides the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who is the number one theologian. We'll say that, okay? But marriage is a preparation for heaven because it is conforming us to Christ's likeness. So wives and submission and husbands, mutual submission, but also in the sacrifice, what we're doing is we're becoming conformed to the image of Christ. J.D. Greer said it this way. He said, marriage is a gospel reenactment. Now, if you're married, Angie, sometimes we'll have a conversation. I said, we well, you know the Bible says there's no marriage or giving to marriage in heaven. She said, I know, but I'm still living with you in your mansion. Okay. And, uh, but now maybe you understand, why does the Lord say that? It's because marriage on this earth is a preparation for us for eternity and conforming us to his Christ likeness. And God created Wives, because husbands are insufficient and they're lacking. Ladies, please understand. Well, let me share this with you. There is a, uh, if I'm a note, this came from uh, some of the Jewish rabbis. When God created woman, he did not create Eve from the head of Adam to rule over him. And he did not create her, create her from the foot uh, of Adam to be his slave. He did not create her from the front of Adam to lead him. He did not create her from the back of Adam to follow him, but he created him from the side of Adam to complete him. Men, we may think we got it figured out, and we may think that we're all-knowing and need nothing from nobody, but we are insufficient and lacking. And God created 
in the context of marriage, a wife for us to complete us. And in that, we are able to represent the picture, the image of the Lord Jesus Christ and be conformed to his Christ likeness. And in fact, practice and demonstrate an attribute and characteristic of the Lord Jesus Christ. J.D. Greer also, in a sermon that he preached on this passage, he said, there are five leadership roles that are given to man in the garden. Okay, so men, just real quickly, pay attention to these, because this uh, I, I can speak more from man's perspective than <laughs> the wife perspective, and I know you know that. But he said, in the garden, God charged us to be the provider. Okay, so he puts Adam in the garden, and there's nothing wrong. Ladies, some of you here, my wife's a school teacher, okay? Some of you here uh, may be a, a dentist or a doctor, or you, you're like a Proverbs 31 woman, okay? There's nothing wrong with all that, okay? I'm just in the context of marriage, I understand. In the context of marriage, the man is to be uh, the provider. I know uh, Angie's daddy's sitting right here on the front row. And I remember when I asked him if I could marry his daughter, he had the flu. He was in bed. He had a white T-shirt on. I remember that. And so uh, he was on his side like this sick. And so Angie said, you got to talk to my daddy. Now, he may not remember this, but I'm very visual. So I remember going in there. I was scared of him then. I'm still scared of him now. So anyway, I go in there. He rolls over in the bed. I think he said, I knew you were coming. Okay, it was like that. And I asked him if I could marry her. Now, he didn't say these exact words, but he knew I had a job. He knew where I worked. But it was like you are charged with taking care of her. We live in a culture today where, and I'll just speak from a man's perspective, we have a lot of young men that don't grasp this. Uh, we have a lot of young men that's like, hey, mama, you've been taking care of me since I was five, and I know I'm 55 now, and mama, I'm expecting you to take care of me. That, that's not biblical in that. Man, young men, let me encourage you with this. You say, well, we're 55, we're not young. Well, let me just encourage you with this. Man, we got to get a job. Yeah, come on now. Hey, look, we're going to be crazy as a country if we don't get it. We have to get a job and provide for our families. Now, I don't know what that is, but, man, God, he blesses in work and hardware. Our bodies are designed to work six days a week. I'm not saying you got to work six days a week, but we're designed to do that. We are the providers. Now, hey, if your wife has got a professional degree in that, like, praise God, hallelujah, you know, I mean by Polaris or something or whatever. But it's not a joke, but it is a joke, yes. But, but the thing is, or a Honda, I just probably offended somebody. I don't know, whatever, whatever you like out there. But the thing is, it's because we're to be that provider. So that's our role. That's man. And if I had a daughter and some boy, young man, <laughs> call him a boy, and, but if he came to my house and, uh, well, I'll tell you what, we have some granddaughters one day. I hope my sons and daughter-in-laws let me in on a conversation when some boy comes asking for her hand in marriage. My first question, I'm like, boy, you got a job. You ain't got no job. Get out of here because I ain't taking you to raise. And you know what? You may say, well, it's in boys' fault. Well, guess what? Do you realize today that between the ages of 0 to 18, almost 80% of boys and girls will live in a household without their mama or their daddy at some point in their lives? That's the culture we live in. So, look, it may be my role as a grandpa-in-law not to say, boy, get off his yard, but to say, young man, let me help you in this situation, okay? I'm going to help you get a job so you can provide for my granddaughter-in-law because I'm not footing a bill for you. You know, some of you think, well, you, Preach, you can't say that. You want me to say that again? I probably can't. But anyway, I'd say it again. So we're to be the provider. Here's the second row. We're to be that uh, spiritual leader. Uh, I think it was J.D. Greer said this. It was so cool. He said, the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated more what it was to be a man when he was a baby in the manger than Adam demonstrated in the garden because Adam didn't act like a man. He acted like a boy. Now, you say, what? Go back and read it, Genesis. When it says she gave the fruit to him and they both knew that they were naked, okay, before God. He was there. Adam was passive. God told Adam. God told Adam, you don't eat of this fruit of this tree. Okay. He was told first and then went through the whole creation of Eve from the side. And it's like, ooh, woman, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. You know, she, you know perfect man, perfect woman, all this, okay. And, but what he did, he, it was his responsibility to pass on that relationship with, with the Lord God Almighty to share with her. And, but he was passive. And, you know, when the serpents come out, he should have grabbed that serpent by the neck. But he didn't. Jesus Christ demonstrated more manhood as a baby in the manger than Adam demonstrated manhood in the garden. Adam wasn't a man. He was a boy. You're probably thinking, Adam's in heaven. He's going to get you when you get there. 
Think about that. Spiritual leader. So, men, it may be a place today. Maybe you're preparing for marriage, thinking about marriage, single, not thinking about marriage, but you are to be that provider and that spiritual leader. Protector. When I was uh, in Uganda and I was preaching and, and doing training with Ugandan pastors and those Congolese guys and stuff, and so I would share this illustration. We talked more about marriage and family and parenting than really we did about doctrine. They're solid in doctrine, but this idea of marriage and family and Situations in Africa, it was just different. And so I was sharing the story about because they all got dingo dogs. They're dingo dogs, and which is amazing to me if you know what those are. So everybody has it, and they're watchdogs. You can't pet them or touch them. They'll bite you, but they stay out in the village and stuff. And so I was using the illustration. I said, we have dogs at my house, which we have Labradors, not dingo dogs. And I said, the, the husband's to be the protector. I said, you know, if, uh, if there's a noise outside and a rustling in the bushes and the dogs are barking, I don't peck on Miss Angie's shoulder and go, hey, baby, hey, baby, wake up. You need to go out there and check because I think somebody's trying to steal something, you know. And so I'm going through the translator, and, uh, you know, I'm telling about this. And when I say I don't peck on her shoulder and send her out there, you know, it's real quiet. And the translator talks, and they go, ha, ah, because they don't do that either. Because in the role of a man, he is the protector You know, he's the one who puts himself in front of his wife. I mean, it's one of our our leadership roles. Another one is uh, being that self-sacrificing person. We're going to talk about that here in just a moment. Uh, But also the romancer. Boy, there's some of you men, y'all did not crack a smile. You didn't do anything. Now, let me tell you the biblical aspect of this. Maybe you've never seen this before. In Genesis and here in the reference back, may the man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. It's the initiation of the man. So when we talk about romance and then loving uh, your wife and caring for her, it's a man's role, okay? Now, here's the second part of this also. So we see that what it is, the gospel empowers a wife to submit, to surrender, but the gospel empowers the man to sacrifice, the husband to sacrifice. So when he he starts speaking there in verse 25, he says, love your wives the way that Christ loved a church. It's an agape love, a self-sacrificing love that you're putting uh, her needs uh, uh, before your needs and and that kind of stuff. And and so you are just like you are submitting to her. Now, yes, the man is the head and he gives leadership and it doesn't mean there's no uh, discussions. Well, let me just give you an illustration just real quick. When Angie and I were praying about coming here and it was just a, you know, we love when and it was like God was ripping her heart out. But I know God told me uh, to be here. Angie came to a point and said, Angie, we got to make a decision in regard to this. She said, what is God telling you to do? I said, God's telling us that we need to go. I said, but Angie, anytime I have a conversation with you or the boys about leaving when, I said, it's not like good. I said, it's like emotional. And I said, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm, I want to follow the Lord, but I feel like I'm ripping my family. Here's what Angie told me. She said, Archie, God speaks to you different. He speaks to me. She said, and, and we have conversations and make decisions and this kind of stuff. Because, men, if you're not listening to your wife's opinion, you're not very smart. God has created her in such a way she sees things and knows things. That, you know, you pop your head, I heard a guy say this, you pop your head open, it looks like a waffle. It's got little compartments in there. And so we put a little syrup over here in this compartment, and we kind of seal it off, and we can go over here. You pop her head open, it's like, I heard this, like spaghetti. It's like all together. You know, and stuff like this. We're just, we can compartmentalize stuff. God has given your wife an intuition. You have to listen to her. And then, so we were at a point, and Angie said, Archie, God speaks to me differently than you. She said, look, I am going to follow your leadership. Because God's not told me, come down and say, you need to go or you need to stay. She says, all I know is I'm called to be your wife. And so where you go, I'm going with you. I said, okay. So sometimes it comes down, even if we call it a tiebreaker, that husband uh, being the leader. Now, this self-sacrificing stuff is where you're putting her for yourself. You know, I learned early on, man, I love to deer hunt. And, uh, uh, you know, you get married, you're freshly married, and like, hey, I'm going off deer hunting, you know. And, and uh, uh, I learned that, you know, about the first couple of days is okay. Boy, about the third or fourth day, you're up in a tree, you know, and you, you say, hey, I ain't killed anything yet, but what do you think about me staying another day? Well, yeah. When, when she says that, you know what that means? You better go home. <laughs> hey, young man, I can help you and save you a lot of pain in marriage. I mean, really, this. Now, why is that? And I learned early on. I'd had some guys. They'd be gone like a week or something. i said, look, I'm glad, you know, if that's okay. I said, but I love my wife more than I love deer hunting. I said, I'm newly married. Now, here's what I learned. You get about two or three kids under your belt. And it's like this. The wife will come to you and say, let's make a deal. You take the kids with you, you can be gone all week. Yes, ma'am. 
Hey, man, I loaded my boys up and took them. They'd fight in a deer stand, fall asleep in a deer stand, eat in a deer stand, call grandma in a deer stand. I mean, all kinds of stuff. But hey, here's the thing. You learn that. And, and here's what I say to that is, and, and, and don't, ladies, please don't take this wrong. Sometimes as men, we say this. Here's our saying. It's grammatically incorrect. Men, you can help me finish the sentence. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody. Hey, let me tell you what. I want my wife happy. And I, I will put her happiness above my duck hunting, my deer hunting, and all this. I, will, I want her to know that I love her. You know, this is a very simple, practical teaching also. And we've got just a couple minutes and we'll close out. There's a book written by Gary Smalley. It's called The Five Love Languages. Any of y'all ever read The Five Love Languages or been through that stuff? About that? Hey, this, is, it, this revolutionized me. There's five of them. Let me, uh, I wrote them in my notes. First is a language of acts of service. Now, this is how someone knows that they're loved. It's acts of service. When you do something for them that they don't ask you to do. So let's speak from a man's perspective. Maybe your wife's language, love language is acts of service. And so if you come in and I can wash clothes, uh, I can dry clothes. I don't do very well drying stuff I'm not supposed to dry, but anyway, I can put them in a dryer. I don't like to fold, but I know how to iron, okay? I can't cook whatsoever, but I can wash dishes. And if you got a dishwasher, praise God, hallelujah for that invention. You can stick them in there, you know? I've learned when I, hey, when I get through eating, I take my plate, I go to the sink. And I was a mama's boy. My mama did everything. Angie trained me. I go to the sink. I wash it off. I stick it in the dishwasher, okay? If, if your wife's love language is acts of service, you take your plate, you wash it off, and you stick it in the dishwasher, you can be sitting over going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's her language. You're speaking her language, okay? So it's acts of service. Second one would be gifts. How many of y'all like gifts? Everybody likes gifts to somewhat, but for some people it's a love language. Hey, wives, there may be a man that his love language is gifts. You go to one of the sporting goods store, you buy him a gift card. Oh, man. You come in, you can tell him, baby, I love you. Baby, you can go deer hunting. He's like, she don't love me because she don't ever buy anything for me. And I'm telling you, I mean, it's like the Eeyore man. She don't love me. You can, he's, his language is a gift, okay? It don't have to be anything. You know what? You could drop by work and go, hey, baby, I bought you a snicker. You know what he'll do? He's like, really? He'll go through the office. She loves me. She loves me. She bought me a snicker at the gas station. Woo! Why? That's his language. Here's our issue. Most of us, we think our spouse has the same love language we have. It usually doesn't work that way. So one of them is gifts. One of them is physical touch, holding hands. A lot of times you say, Angie and I, we hold hands. Okay? It's physical touch. That's, that's a love language of mine. Just hold my hand. She holds my hand. I'm like, this baby loves me right here. Okay? I love, I love snicker bars, but you bring one by my office. I'm like, hey, thank you. I appreciate that. You can buy me a gift card. I love gift cards. I'm like, thank you. You hold my hand. I'm like, woo. I can feel it. I feel the love. Another one is verbal affirmation, words. When she tells her, holds my hand, she looks at me and she says, you're so big and strong. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> my love tank just got filled up. And in his book, he calls it the love tank. Okay? So uh, words of affirmation, quality time. That is not my language. You do not have to spend time with me. You don't have to set me down and go, how are you doing? You do not. I'll be like, dude, I got to go. I need some coffee. Come on. That's enough. What? You know? Now, I'm not saying as a man you need to reach out and hold my hand either. Okay? So don't do that. But. Quality time can be a language. So quality time is you spend time. If you just sat down with a person whose love language is quality time, one of your, your spouse, and go, hey, how are you doing? It's like, oh. A lot of times what happens in this, men, you're not speaking the language of your wife. You think, well, she holds my hand. She holds my hand. I feel love. So when I hold her hand, she feels love. Mm -mm. She's holding your hand because she likes you, and she wants you to feel love because she knows you're a big baby. And... Uh, Y'all catch that in a little bit. Okay. And, uh, but that's not her language. She's doing that because she loves you. She's basically sacrificing for you. But now if her love language is acts of service, you get that vacuum cleaner going, you wash those dishes. If you just think about it, men, the ladies are going to know. I guarantee you, your wife, husband, she knows what your love language is, whatever it is. Men, you just need to think. You need to be a student of your wife. Now, I'm not saying I always do that. You need to be a student of your wife. And here's what you need to understand about this love thing. If you don't show your wife the attention and the love that God commands us to, you have to be very careful. Now, I'm not saying this is right, but someone else will. Never stop pursuing, and we'll call it 
romancing, just holding a hand or words of affirmation. Never stop pursuing and loving your wife, men. We usually don't have to teach wives that. We have to teach men that. So the gospel, Christ, empowers a husband to love sacrificially. And then it leads us to the last point that the gospel is what empowers a marriage to succeed. In the beginning with Adam and Eve, it was not the sin of eating the forbidden fruit. I guess we could say that's what it was, but it, it wasn't the sin of commission. Yes, it was sin, but it was the sin of omission because he did not lead her the way he's supposed to. You see, God has set this thing up to work. If we will just be obedient, and don't let, allow this text to get misconstrued or misunderstood where a, a lady you think you're supposed to be the doormat and you're not valued when in fact you are equal with the man. Don't, don't allow that, but to understand that when you demonstrate submissiveness and subjecting yourself to the headship of your husband who's loving you in a sacrificial way that you are reflecting the image of God and you are also demonstrating and expressing the attribute and characteristic of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, God is raising us up in marriage to be the picture of the church and the bride and preparing us for heaven and conforming us to his image. That's why he gave us marriage. I know we think he gave us marriage because we like need each other and we love each other. Man, we're a good team together and it's all about us. No, it's all about him. And you want this thing to work right, it's very simple. Yes, Jesus is the answer and he has to be at the center of your marriage. So maybe this is where we're all day. Maybe some of you are here and you're, you're married. Maybe you're preparing for marriage. Maybe you're thinking about marriage in the future. But you're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe today in this invitation time is where you just say, hey, I just want to maybe recommit uh, my prospective marriage or the marriage I have now. Just recommit that to the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe for a man, maybe God has prompted your, Holy Spirit's prompted your heart in some way where you realize, hey, I'm not being the leader that I need to be. I'm not loving her sacrificially. Maybe you have some misunderstanding of this text. Maybe you've heard it before. Maybe you heard your dad say it, but you didn't understand mutual submission. And so maybe this is a place just of repenting of that as a believer saying, Lord, I'm just wrong in that. And, and Lord, give me strength. Holy Spirit, empower me because he will. Empower me to love my wife the way that Christ loved the church or as a wife. Holy Spirit, empower me to, to submit myself, okay, under the headship of the husband, of my husband, and, and to, to follow him, to to lay down my agenda so that he can lead uh, out and be the leader of this family. And maybe that's your prayer this morning. Or in reality, some of you may have a struggling marriage today because uh, Jesus is not in the center of that marriage. And, in fact, he's not in the center of marriage because you don't have that relationship with him. Um, did I know enough about right and wrong to... Learn early on, even though I wasn't saved, that I don't need to tell her after she's worked in the kitchen half a day preparing my first meal as a married couple that I don't eat potato salad. I probably went into, I probably just gave a commentary, running commentary on why I didn't like it. I've never eaten it before, and I'm not ever going to eat it when she's almost, you know, broken or what I said. I didn't have to be saved to know not ever to do that again, Okay. But when I got saved at age 25, my life changed and my married life changed. Why is that? Because I began to understand mutual submission but also loving sacrificially. You may have a struggle down in marriage because you're not born again. You're not saved. And today can be that day of submitting as a man or woman to what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That's surrendering to him, saying, Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. You died for me on that cross. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, I repent. I turn from my sin. Lord, I mean, you know, maybe you're brought up as a man thinking, I, I'll do this my way. You know, I'll do it how I want to do it. I'm going to do it how Daddy did it and Grandpa did it. And, you know, you're under conviction, no, that's not right. I need to submit to the Lord. So, Lord Jesus, save me. Forgive me. Do you realize that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved? He paid the price. Why? Because Jesus willingly submitted himself to the will of the triune God, the Trinity, who he is a part of. And came and took on flesh so that he might die for you and me. So he modeled it. And you can be saved today by asking him out in refuge. You can be saved today by just calling upon him. By Facebook, live stream, you be saved today just calling upon him. If you call upon him, he'll save you. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to pray. And then we're going to stand. Now, this is a place of responding to what God is doing in your life. Here 
out in refuge. So that means you can come forward. You can pray and speak with one of the pastors that are here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to come together. Lord, marriage is an institution you gave us. You have set this thing up to give us a picture of your relationship with the church, to prepare us for heaven, to conform us to Christ's likeness, to your image. Lord Jesus, just good stuff. And so, Lord, I pray that today we would respond to you in the right way. There's some who need to be saved today. Uh, Lord, and I pray they're calling upon you right now. I pray they would not be ashamed of you. I pray they'd come to one of these pastors. Hey, today, today I got saved. Today I've surrendered my life to Christ. I've submitted to him. And I, I, I place my agenda to the side. I'm, I'm all about him. And so, Lord, I pray that takes place. Maybe there's some here who just need to pray. I pray there'd be an openness and a freedom. Lord, have your way. Maybe someone can just be open enough to say, you know what? Our marriage is, uh, hey, it's, it's difficult. Could we get one of the pastors to pray for us? Man, that's the beginning of healing, I believe. It's coming to place. Maybe one spouse needs to ask for forgiveness of another one here out in refuge. It can be the beginning of healing. Today can be the beginning of something wonderful. I pray you take advantage of it. Your name we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.